You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. Today we sit down with Dr. Michael Horn, Director of Clinical Services for Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington, as he talks about invisible losses from the pandemic. I couldn't attend the wedding of a friend. I couldn't have my family at my daughter's first communion. We couldn't have birthday parties for our kids. We couldn't go camping last summer. We had Thanksgiving alone without friends. Hear Dr. Horn talk about the importance of processing these losses if we want to move forward and heal. Today's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer at the Catholic Diocese of Arlington. Let's jump right in. Dr. Horn, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Billy. Pleasure to be here. So we're going to get into some interesting topics here about, you know, kind of the um, the invisible loss of the pandemic, but any any trauma in general that people go through and, and dig into some of those topics. Before we do that, though, I want to ask you a little bit about your background, because we've had you on the podcast before, but I don't think we've talked about how did you get into, you know, the world of clinical counseling? You went to Divine Mercy University, which is right here in the diocese, and it's, it's a beloved institution of our diocese. Bishop Burbage is very supportive of it for good reason, because it produces men like you and women <laughs> that we have around the diocese who are doing um, this great work. But talk about what made you interested in getting into that work, and what is the training and the education like to get you there? Sure. Um, I'll start off by saying that my path there was really atypical. I was working um, in television, uh, and at that time, I started coming back to my faith. I was cradle Catholic, but I wasn't practicing the faith until about my, my mid-20s. And I thought when I was working in TV, I'd really not only achieved sort of something good professionally, but I was doing something good for people because I thought, what could be better than entertaining people? Surely that's one of the highest callings. But as I started to really get into my faith more, I thought, no, there is more. And I felt that God was putting a a call on my heart to say, no, you want to help people. Bring people to me. Lead people to flourishing. And in that, this was uh, 2001, I started looking around thinking, well, where can I do that? Where can I go to a place that combines my faith with a solid understanding of the human person. And it became very clear very quickly that Divine Mercy University was that place. Mm. At the time, it was the Institute for Psychological Sciences. And I uh, applied, went, and was blown away by the people that I was meeting there. The training I got from the faculty was fantastic, but also meeting people who were coming from around the country to try to figure out how do we really help people flourish? Not just remove symptoms, but flourish. I think one of the major distinctions that we talk about within the context of the field, what makes a Catholic psychology different from a secular psychology, is that a Catholic psychology seeks a freedom for, as opposed to a freedom from. A secular approach might take the perspective of, we want a client to have a freedom from depression, freedom from anxiety, freedom from symptoms. But the Catholic approach is so much deeper. We want a freedom for flourishing, a freedom for the ability to say yes to what God asks of us in our lives. And being in a place like that, surrounded by people who were equally passionate about that, I thought this is fantastic, and this is how we're truly going to change lives. Yeah. So you uh, you finished with Divine Mercy University. Mm-hmm. You finished your. Now you did you because it's you either go into the master's program or the doctoral program, Correct. right? So you went the doctoral route. What is different between those programs? Great question. So the doctorate program is going to be a doctorate in psychology, not a PhD, but a PsyD. And it's aimed predominantly at really helping uh, prepare clinicians to go and serve people you know, with an array of complex presenting issues. Um, counseling is going to do the same, but it's going to be more focused on, we really want to make sure that the, the, the connections with the person we're working on that psychology goes into a lot of other stuff consultation assessment things like that um, it also goes into a little bit of, of teaching and research mm-hmm. so I was always very interested in um, in the variety the idea of doing yeah. IQ testing I thought was great so for me I thought this is worth it to go longer to have to write that dissertation <laughs> but to be able to come out and uh, really be able to do a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, in the diocese or wherever I happen to be serving amongst that kind of buffet of things that you're able to do what do you find yourself doing the most just in terms of just time um, what a great question right now I think the thing I find myself doing the most actually is supervising. I supervise a lot of a lot of interns who are in the process of getting their doctorate. And I love that. I love being able to help people who are right at the start of their career and help build confidence for them, but also set them on a path to say, look, this is really the way that we can go and, and work with people and bring them closer to Christ. 
That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Full disclosure, my wife's in the master's program. And oh, she's loving job. it. Yeah. She's like a little <laughs> over a year, I think, into it, maybe a year and a half at this point. But she's very, uh, she's on the, the part time track and uh, really in, enjoying it a lot. So, yeah, if, if you uh, just Google Divine Mercy University, you'll find it. It's, it's right here in the diocese. And again, it is really a beloved institution because it's doing so much good. And I know our, our priests really rely on mm-hmm. a lot of the, uh, the counselors and the clinicians from um, that are Divine Mercy University trained yeah. um, to assist them in their ministry um, as well because they, they're brought a lot of challenging cases and you all are there to, to help them walk through that. So thank you, by the way, for, for doing all that. Sure. So we're, we're coming out of a really rough year, which is almost like a cliche to say anymore. <laughs> but um, but it's true. I mean, people have lost loved ones to, mm-hmm. to death. We, people have lost, um, you know, their, their health. You know, they may be you know, suffering permanent issues from COVID. Others, it's just the, um, like myself, I didn't, I didn't know anyone personally who died from COVID, uh, but it, it is a it was such a weird year, and it had such an impact on the family overall that you can kind of feel some of that that strain right. weigh on you, especially the longer it goes on. And almost like now that it's releasing and we're we're not wearing masks and we're not social distancing and masses is back, mm-hmm. that um, or mass you know the uh, dispensation has been lifted. That now we're kind of in this new posture. I almost feel like some people are noticing the stress now. And I, I, there's got you're going to be able to explain it for me. I'm sure. sure better that I would be able to you know kind of come up with it in my own brain. But talk about the, some of the invisible signs of of kind of trauma that come out of a pandemic like we've just been through. Absolutely. Well, and I think to your to your first point, why are we feeling it now? We've been doing this for 15 months. This isn't this isn't new. I think sometimes we just get in survival mode. I have to get through this. I have to persevere. I just have to keep pushing. And then when that stress releases. That's when our minds and our bodies go, oh, my goodness, I just need to stop. Oh, yeah. okay. And then we almost let those things catch up with us. There's actually, it's, it's funny you were mentioning grad school earlier. Uh, there is a phenomenon most grad students experience is that they will grind and grind and grind all semester long. And within 24 hours uh, of them finishing their final exam or final paper, they get sick. Yeah. They're just down for the count for at least three <laughs> days. It's because we finally know it's okay to stop. It's okay to recognize that we really need a break, or in this case, we need to grieve. Now, the question I think people are asking is, well, hang on, what, what am I grieving? To your point, I, like you, haven't lost any loved ones from COVID. It's been a challenging year, but in some ways a very good year. I've been able to spend more time yeah. with, my, you know, with my family. That's been wonderful. I think in many ways it's drawn us closer together. But it doesn't mean that it's been a year without losses. So a lot of the things that, that I'm hearing, I, I hear people say things like, well, I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. I haven't lost anything personally, or I, I shouldn't complain. It hasn't been the end of the world. That's not helpful because we have to recognize we have all lost something, whether or not it's obvious and huge or small and, and, and less woven in. This is the idea of these smaller losses, this disenfranchised grief, mm. these little invisible losses. Because what happens is that we unhelpfully compare our losses to others and think, well, it's mine isn't as bad as somebody else's, therefore I don't have the right to grieve. Yeah. But let me give you some examples of, of uh, these sort of invisible losses that we might not think of as losses, but over time they impact us, especially if they, if, if they build up. So these are things that either I've experienced in my own life or that I've heard you know, uh, friends either professionally or personally say, I couldn't attend the wedding of a friend. I couldn't have my family at my daughter's first communion. We couldn't have birthday parties for our kids. We couldn't go camping last summer. We had Thanksgiving alone without friends. I haven't been able to see my godson in person, and I'm not able to attend his baptism. All of those things I think we can look at and realize, no, it's not a death, but it's a sorrow. It's a loss that in the absence of the pandemic, all of these things would have been a given. Of course we're gonna have parties for the kids. Right. Of course we're going to have Thanksgiving, but now we're having to deal with the fact that we haven't, and there's a sadness there that we have to be able to accept and process if we're really going to heal, because it does add up over time. Mm-hmm. It starts to weigh us down. It's almost the, uh, the image of a death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. But sooner or later, we just go, something just doesn't feel right anymore, and I can't put my finger on it. 
Yeah. How do you recognize when the, it's like how many grains of sand does it take to create a mound? You know, it's like, when do you realize that you need to go seek out some help? Because there, there used to be much more of a stigma to getting counseling. People would think, sure. you know, you, you had totally lost your mind if you were getting counseling. Now I think it's seen a lot more as this is part of an overall health plan. You know, if you've got mildly high blood pressure, we take a mildly intensive uh, blood pressure medication or, you know, so same thing that not everybody needs intensive psychotherapy, mm-hmm. but sometimes some a counseling session here and there will help help kind of keep a, a solid baseline for you. So when do you, when would someone notice in themselves that, oh, I'm exhibiting the signs that I need to go and, and seek out some help the way they would with their physical body recognize it fairly easily. I feel like sometimes it's, we either stuff and say, just suck it up and get through, or I don't have time right, or whatever. Right. But what are the signs that people should look for when they should maybe reach out? Well, I think like a like a physical thing, it's the idea of something doesn't feel right. I don't feel like myself. Mm-hmm. We are really, um, bad at attending to what's going on for us in the moment. We tend to assume we're pretty consistent and we're fine, 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 fine, until one day we look and go, oh, I'm I'm not fine. Right. I'm really not fine. But if we'd been paying more attention, it's really more of a, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm doing all right, Uh, I'm not that great. Actually, I'm feeling pretty down. It's more of a steady decline that we just don't pay attention to because to your point, we just either try to push on or assume, you know what, I I just need to knuckle through. I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. This shouldn't be a big deal. Because again, it goes back to this idea of, you know, what am I upset about? Nobody's dying. Nobody's lost their job. Am I really that sad that no one came over for Thanksgiving? Well, it's okay to be sad that nobody came over for Thanksgiving. Yeah. If it's something that is completely different from A, what you normally do, or B, what you hoped it would be, it takes a toll. So when we start to see that something's not right inside And if we start to see ourselves being affected in other areas, if we have less energy than we used to, if we're just less excited, if we just feel blue, that might be maybe just a few mild elements of depression that are an indication that something might not be exactly the way it should be. Yeah. How do men and women do that differently? I think that women... There's probably books written on that, but there, I, there you, are. But you got a whole 30 seconds. Don't oh, worry. Oh, absolutely. No problem. I got this. Um, women, I think, will tend to look more at the relational elements and will tend to reach out to other people. Guys tend to just keep working harder. Okay. They tend to shut things down more. They're not going to talk about it because, again, there's a sense of... I haven't lost anything. Nothing bad has happened, so what's my problem? Yeah. Let me just, you know, go back and grind some more. Right. Okay. All right. I'm sure that impacts the way you have to kind of counsel somebody through mm-hmm. is, is the way they kind of receive the information, whether they stuff it or whether they're maybe even exaggerating, you know, to themselves the impact of something. I'm right. sure it can take different forms. No, it can. I think, too, that um, I, we have to understand that being sad isn't a sign of weakness. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at the example our Lord gave us. You know, he, he wept. That doesn't mean he's weak. It means that he's human. Yeah. And we don't have to deny our our emotions and our normal human experience as something less than or something unbecoming or something bad. We feel what we feel. For maintaining mental health, what are good things that people can do, you know, in addition to receiving counseling, but you know, maybe they're not ready for that yet? What are other things that people can do that would maybe help kind of blunt the edge of that sort of it? Well, I think when we're specifically talking about losses, we really need to be able to process the loss. And that starts with, with understanding the loss, acknowledging that there actually is a loss. It's okay to admit we've been hurt. It's okay to, to feel our feelings. It's okay to be angry or sad that certain things have happened or haven't happened. And I think that one of the things that we are particularly lousy at in this country is, is grieving. Um, this is something that, as a nation, we don't seem to be particularly good culturally at hmm. grieving because there are two different elements to grief. The first is we have to grieve the loss of the specific, but we also have to grieve the loss of, of potential. So when I talk about the, the, the loss of a specific, that's I have a relationship, now it's gone. I had a job and I've lost it. This thing was in my life and now it's not there. And the hole that it leaves is obvious. We can see that. We understand the absence of something. And we can sort of understand how we need to grieve that. But the loss of potential is something else. And in some ways, the loss of potential is actually more complicated and more painful. Because what that is, it's mourning the loss of what you had hoped things would be like. So the way God made us, we have very powerful imaginations. If we can think about something, we can engage with it emotionally. Now, I read this in grad school in a book, and I just thought, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. But the more I've been in practice, the more I see it. 
So there was an example uh, of a young woman who I worked with many, many years ago in a different state, and she was really having a difficult time getting over this one relationship in college. Now, she'd been in other relationships before, and she wasn't sure why she just kept getting stuck on this one. And I, kind of on a whim, I asked her in session one time, I said, did you ever, did you ever imagine your life with, uh, we'll pretend his name was Andy, with Andy? And her eyes got really big, and she said, yeah. Yeah, I did. We were going to have three kids. She lists the names of the children. They were going to have you know, his eyes because he's got the most beautiful eyes. They were going to have my hair because I really like my hair. We were going to live in this sort of house and we were going to have this kind of dog. She's describing for me an entire life that she has clearly spent dozens and dozens and dozens of hours thinking about. And all of that now is gone. Even though she never had it, she still has to think about the fact that it wasn't mm. to be. And that's hurtful, that, that, that it takes time to process it. Um, I mean, to, to use a similar example, let's say, I don't know, I'll pick, on my, I'll pick on my eight-year-old daughter. Let's say my daughter passes away. Not only do I have to mourn the loss of my beloved daughter, but I also have to mourn every Christmas, yeah. every Thanksgiving. I have to mourn high school graduations. I have to mourn college. I have to mourn simultaneously the idea of seeing her take her final vows and dancing with her at her wedding. Because all of these are things that I have imagined for her. And if she's not there and all of those potentials are removed, I have to acknowledge that thing that I wanted, the thing that I desired, the thing that I hoped for isn't there anymore. The more you describe it, the more it seems like that loss of potential is a far more profound grief because it's compounding. Correct. And it's, you know, it's it's all these things that could have happened. Mm -hmm. um, is it also kind of uh, distorted because it, it doesn't reflect, you know, um, challenging experiences? With your daughter, it's maybe not the best example, but, um, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to think of an example now, but, you know, this woman was going to marry Andy. And he might have turned out to be a jerk. Sure, sure absolutely. <laughs> he might not have been yeah. a nice guy. Right. Or, like, there's all kinds of, like, she, she could have, it could have been a great marriage, but there was, uh, she had a miscarriage. And there's right. grief that would have, right. you know, struck on her down there. How does, should that be kind of factored into someone when they're thinking, if someone's stuck in that mode right now and they're lamenting things that they didn't get to do um, during COVID or, you know, they, they lose a job, should they kind of factor in? Well, there's things that I'm not going to have to deal with, and there's no opportunity that I have ahead of me. If I didn't get the job that I wanted, mm -hmm. well, there's another job that maybe I'm called to. It's a good question. I think I think focusing on on what it is God's actually asking of you or offering you, that's going to be the way forward. Because thinking about the negative things you won't have to experience, that's not going to resonate with folks because they haven't emotionally engaged with it. So instead mm -hmm. saying, okay, sure, you'd hope for this, but do we have the trust and the faith that what God is offering is going to be equally beautiful or better. Mm. And do we have that do we have that trust? Do we do we allow ourselves <clears throat> to see that God's not abandoning us? That God hasn't led us somewhere and dumped us and said, "Oh, sorry. That mm -hmm. was your one ticket for happiness and you blew it." But instead say, "Okay, let me focus on what's now mm. good in my life and 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 what I could have in the future." Yeah. Um what do you find are common missteps for people who are trying to work their own way through grief? The kind of, I'll, I'll figure it out, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, are there, are there common uh, kind of mental tricks people play on themselves that you you're, you're notice come up over and over again? Sure, the biggest thing is that they just deny it. Mm -hmm. And that um, <coughs> they think, this hasn't happened, what's the big deal? Yeah. Why am I mourning something that, that, that never actually took place or never, never actually occurred? So um, they tend to try to push that aside and they tend to just say, look, I'm not going to think about it because I'm making too big about a deal about this. And they're denying the actual emotion itself. I think in, in part, we're really afraid of suffering. Yeah. We, we, don't, we, we don't like suffering. We don't like pain. And the longer that we avoid it, the more complicated it gets. So it's the equivalent of, let's say, um, I've broken my leg. But I think, I, I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have time to have a broken leg, you know. Or it's not that bad. I'll just keep going. I, don't, I just keep running. I'm going to be a mess in about six months if I just keep yeah. running on a leg that was broken. Right. So we have to be able to stop and say, no, you know, whether I want this to hurt or not, it hurts. Yeah. And I, I, I have to engage with that. I've got to, I, I, I've got to recognize I have the right to experience my grief. 
and <clears throat> um, and I have to. Yeah, I, I have to deal with it. Yeah, as you've um, you know, you do a lot of. I'm assuming you were on the road a lot, uh, meeting people for for uh, counseling, and you probably had to do a lot of uh, tele <coughs> telehealth teletherapy as time went on. Um, as you're talking with people who are dealing with effects more from COVID than not, like they probably wouldn't have needed you if it hadn't been for this this kind of trauma. Are there common um, struggles that people are dealing with that you're seeing come up and over and over and over again? Or is it more of the circumstantial things that were in their life that got messed up that are, are kind of bringing them to you? I think it's a piece of both. I mean, there's definitely the circumstantial things, but we're seeing huge increases in isolation and depression and anxiety and just uncertainty. We don't we don't know what the future is going to hold. We've just lived through something that nobody expected. Right. Nobody had a plan for. No, mm-hmm. Nobody thinks to themselves, okay, you know, back in 2005, we think, you know, if I ever have to face a global pandemic that kind of shuts down most of my life for 15 months, I got that. I know exactly how I'm going to respond. A lot yeah. of us were just trying to figure out the best steps as we went forward. Yeah. Some of us, I think, you know, even in trying to do the best we could, misstepped or didn't realize how hard things were actually going to be. So I yeah. see a lot of those. I see a lot of those common themes, but there is a real unique um, personalized element to people's grief. It's what it's it's how is it specifically impacted them? What are what are their losses and recognizing that their losses are are no more or less significant than anybody else's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I've witnessed uh, just through some friends is that in the same household, people will suffer the same um, phenomenon, you know, trauma, but the, the husband and the wife in particular, they process it very differently. So actually I use the example of a miscarriage. Actually, that's one case of someone I know who the, the husband seems to be trudging along. Okay. Which I doubt is, you know, (laughs) I think it's a below the surface thing, but, um, she's much more vocal about it. What are some communication strategies couples can use when they're grieving the same incident in very different ways? How can they communicate to one another, like an appreciation of what the other's going through or not going mm-hmm. through, and that you don't have to look, your grief doesn't have to look like mine, Correct. but I can still respect it, not think that you're downplaying maybe what's happening or over-exaggerating an incident. Right. No, it's a great question. And I think you're, the example of a miscarriage is a, a, a prime example because men and women do experience those grief, not just differently, but really at different times. Yeah. Husbands are much more likely to experience grief after a miscarriage 24 months after the loss of the pregnancy because their focus then becomes my wife is hurting, my family's hurting, I have to focus on them. So the crisis shifts, it's I've gotta take care of you. Oh, and in the then, immediate, that's what correct. they're doing. That's okay. what they do immediately. And then afterwards, it's when things get better, that's when things start to surface more for the guys. Um, I think though, it's always important to just talk about where where we are and to sit down and say, okay, you know, how, how are we doing? And this is what's going on for me. And I don't, I, I can't control why I feel the way I do or how I feel the way I do, but we can at least be honest about it. And to say, you know, I. I I see what you're going through and I and I love you and I feel things slightly differently. Not to say that I disagree. We can experience things differently in the same way that you know we might have different tastes or interests. Obviously those are very different things, but people have a different pain threshold. People have a different noise tolerance of what is and what isn't loud. People have a different uh, ability to, you know, go for longer without sleeping than other people. Mm-hmm. But to basically just say, I'm not judging you. I'm here. How do we do this together? It's really an attempt to say, how do we make sure that we are approaching this as collaboratively as possible? And most importantly, how can I continue to show you that I am here? Mm. What can I help you with? How do I support you in this? I may not know what I need, but I'll tell you when I do. Well, I've, I've heard of uh, you know instances where there's like the loss of a child, and you know a year, two, three years later, the couple divorces, and it seems like, and again, I'm, I'm doing this from the outside. You're you're in in meetings with folks who have gone through this kind of stuff. <clears throat> they try to grieve separately because they're grieving differently. Mm-hmm. And when it sounds like what you're saying is you have to be a united front, and that we're both grieving. We're just doing it differently, Correct. but together. Yep. And does that kind of is that the recipe for success that you're, you're kind of indicating? I think so. I was talking to somebody once who had experienced a very painful miscarriage. And she was talking about how she and her husband were really able to stay together and cope. Because you're right. You hear a lot of stories. The loss of a child sometimes sadly can result in the loss of a marriage. Yeah. Whether or not the couple is separated or, or, or distant from each other or blame each other. Mm-hmm. They very quickly become divided. But this, this very wise woman that I spoke to said, the only way forward is together holding hands at the foot of the cross. 
Mm. But the idea that, you know, you have to be there, you have to be united, recognizing that you may experience things differently, you may feel things in different ways at different times, but there must be that desire and that commitment to say we must go on together. Mm. You spend your, your whole professional life and ministry, you know, serving people who are struggling with difficult situations. Um, now there's a chance if, if people are, you know, there's a, there's a group of people listening. Is, is there some general message that you feel like, boy, I wish I could say this to a larger audience? You know, you're, you're working one on one with people mostly. And I'm sure there's times where it's like, could I grab a megaphone somewhere and, and share this message? Is there anything you would want to share with those who are listening? I think there are two things jump to mind. I mean, the first, in whatever we are coping, we need to make sure that we are looking for opportunities to find joy. It's so easy to focus on the loss. Mm -hmm. We need to challenge ourselves to really lean in and try to find hope and to find the things that we can be joyful about. Now, joy doesn't mean the same thing as happy. Joy is deeper. It can mm -hmm. sometimes be quieter. It can be, it can be more lasting, more significant. So I think if we can do that, if we can really try to find the, the, that joy in our lives, in the people around us, in our relationship with God, that I think is, is hugely important for anyone who's struggling with mental health issues or who has a loved one who's struggling with mental health issues. The other thing is, I mentioned earlier, we are really afraid of suffering. That's something that I wish we could do a better job at is because suffering in and of itself is not bad. There's a difference between suffering and misery. Misery is just pain with no growth, no gain, no purpose. That's terrible. Nobody should have to experience misery. But suffering can be a source of growth. Suffering is us being united to Christ on the cross. It, does, it doesn't mean it's easy. But there's meaning there, there's purpose there. And where misery focuses inwards and it's very difficult to see anyone else around us, suffering sometimes can really allow us to see other people and connect more deeply with other people around us. So those are the things I think that sometimes can really um, move us forward, both in our, in our spiritual growth, but also just in the way that we connect with other people. So to not be afraid of suffering, but to recognize if I have to suffer, let this be something that God brings good out of and let me rely on other people to really help me on this journey. I'm actually going to look this up while we're talking because um, St. Uh, Jose Maria Escriva mm -hmm. has a great line about the Christian revolution. Have I said this to you on a podcast? Well, I'm worried so. that no, I'm, I'm no, repeating no. the same quote. Uh, um, so let me just look this up real quick uh, because it's, it's one of the best uh, lines. He talks about the Christian revolution. And as he said, uh, the great Christian revolution has been to convert pain into fruitful suffering and to turn a bad thing into something good. We have deprived the devil of this weapon, and with it we conquer eternity. It's my favorite quote about suffering of all yeah. time, because I've given talks about my cancer experience and so on, and I always I, I bring it back to to this uh, pretty regularly because I've seen I had two battles with cancer. The first time I really embraced the suffering and took it to the foot of the cross, and I, I did it the right way, so to speak, mm -hmm. and it was hugely beneficial to my life. And I look back on it, and I almost don't see it as a bad thing because of everything that I learned from it and the growth that happened there. And it's only because we, we deprive the devil of this weapon and we con with it we conquer eternity because we embrace Christ. Now, the second time I cancer, I did not do that. I, 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 I kind of abandoned my faith for a time there, and it was a radically different experience. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was talking with a, a friend today who was going through some pretty heavy stuff. And what piece of advice I had for him was that, listen, I'm not trying to beat you up about anything, but I think you're missing the opportunity in yeah. some of the suffering. And that's a hard thing to understand when you're, especially when you're grieving something, because you know you have to be careful about how you would say that mm -hmm. too, because um, there's different types of traumas and different types sure. of, of, of events. But um, like the loss of a child, I'm not gonna tell somebody, well, you're missing the opportunity and what you can learn no. here. But there is a truth buried in there that, there can be growth both despite this, but even because of this. And that'll never make it good that you, you lost a child or your parents got divorced or whatever it is that you're, you're suffering from. But there can be growth despite that only through God. Mm -hmm. Because without God, if we live in a, a, a truly atheistic world, 
there is no good to any of this. It's just suffering, right. and it's endless, right. and it's and, it, and it's um, yeah, it's just all misery. There's yeah, no, it just it, it stops there. Right. But that's a beautiful part of our faith mm-hmm. uh, that we have that. Well, and within that too, I really like what you're saying to say like you know I, I want to be there for my friend. I know I can't just say like okay, go on, suffer, suffer well. Right, right, right. Um, but we've got the opportunity to accompany somebody. Yeah, I don't need to have the answer. I just need for you to know that I'm here mm-hmm. and I'm with you. Yeah, I think that's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if someone's at the point where they're ready to, you've given us good, you know, kind of tools and, and thoughts. Um, if someone is ready with that, you know, I do need to go talk to somebody who does this for a living and is, you know, where I'm a very forgettable patient. I think my problems are the worst ever. They've seen a million people like me. Mm-hmm. Where should they go to find a good counselor? Because it is important to find the right counselor, especially if you're Catholic. It's great to find a Catholic one if you can. Sure. What's the, is there a network they can tap into or a place they can call to get reference? There are a couple. Obviously, Catholic Charities has got you know a lot of counselors who are very solid in the faith and want to be able to provide those services. I think grounded. most people think that's just for those who are low income, but like anybody, that's a good starting point. It's a, for. It's a good starting point there. Beyond that, there are things like CatholicTherapist.com. Uh, oh, okay. There are a lot of different... Um, there are a lot of different... Uh, resources in the area. We're actually, we're in some ways spoiled for choice with uh, you know, faithful resources because Divine Mercy is here and it really attracts a lot of great professionals. So people like, um, you know, we've, the, the IPS training clinic is very good, Alpha Omega. There are great individual mm-hmm. practitioners who are uh, floating around, many of whom I've got a lot of great respect for. Um, you know, certainly the Bennetts are doing incredible work. So there are a lot yeah, of people Art around. Bennett Art Bennett Lorraine, and his, yeah. his wife, Lorraine, and, and his daughter, Dr. Liana. That's right. Um, that's right. You know, yeah. So uh, there are a, a bunch of, of really wonderful, faithful, compassionate people who want to be able to help. That's wonderful. And thank you. Thank you for, one, your time and being willing to come in and, and share this with us. But, you know, you, you dedicate your whole professional life to helping people who are really suffering with something. And that is a beautiful mm-hmm. ministry. It's an extension of Christ's mercy and his compassion and love for us. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And if there's ever anything we can do for you, you know where to find us. Thanks so much, Billy. Thanks. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.